tonight saying farewell to Canada's 18th Prime Minister, the poignant tributes the fond memories at the state funeral for Brian Mulroney. His humanity defined him, which is why he transcended politics. Plus a massacre in Moscow, the aftermath of Russia's deadliest terrorist attack in decades. Did the Kremlin ignore warnings? And outpouring of support after the revelation from Princess Kate about her cancer diagnosis. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight from Montreal. State funerals are grand affairs, and this one, inside Montreal's stunning Notre Dame Basilica, had it all. Politicians, dignitaries, celebrities, and former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's family. His only daughter, Caroline, was the first to speak. Spending time with him was a joy. We would sit in his den and talk for hours. We are heartbroken by our loss. We adored him. I miss you, Daddy. One of his first lessons would be that winning is important and it's okay to enjoy it. However, winning for winning's sake cannot be the only end game. Good evening from Montreal and thanks for joining us. We are next to Notre Dame Basilica where the state funeral for former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney was held today. It was a Catholic service in keeping with Mulroney's faith, but it was filled with songs, poignant moments and deeply personal reflections. Eric Sorensen is outside the Basilica tonight. Eric. Donna, it was somber and sad, but also a day to celebrate the life of Brian Mulroney. On a snowy day and escorted by Mounties, a magnificent and very Canadian farewell to Brian Mulroney, Canada's 18th Prime Minister. 1,600 invited guests, old political friends and foes from the corporate world and small town Bay Como, the famous and not famous, together to remember a remarkable leader, husband and father. He was a truly great father. Daughter Caroline said the kids knew he was an important public figure, but what mattered most to her father to her brothers and to Mila, married to Brian for 51 years, was the bedrock importance of family. There was never a day, not one, when my brothers and I did not speak with our father. Sweetie, it's your old daddy calling, he would say. The Prime Minister saw in Brian Mulroney a visionary who governed not for headlines in 10 days, but a better country in 10 years. Mulroney was confident Canada could be a free trading nation, they could make a difference on the environment, and that national unity was a cause always worth fighting for. His most cherished victories were nonpartisan. Those moments where the true winner was Canada itself, because he loved this country with all his heart. Corporate titan Pierre Carl Pelado remembered a labor lawyer who understood labor relations. He was fair and knew everybody need to have a good deal. There was Mulroney's relationship with two former U.S. presidents. A staunch and supportive friend who had the confidence to tell us when he thought a different American approach might serve our country better. To a once young protege, Mulroney made his time in office count for something. We live in a world that he helped shape. We live in the country that he helped build. In a poignant emotional ceremony, it was the non-politician who liked what he saw today. I'm so proud to be a Canadian today to see past prime ministers here, the current prime minister. That's what our country is all about, coming together, being friendly, helping other people and paying respects. Such an occasion ultimately comes back to family. Music and singing, a big part of Mulroney's life. Je vais chanter. His granddaughter, Elizabeth Theodora Lapham, had to compose herself, then sang superbly. And with Irish eyes are smiling, the congregation was joined on tape by Brian Mulrooney himself. 
When Irish hearts are happy All the world seems bright and gay it was such a poignant moment, and as Wayne Gretzky said, it was a day for Canadians to pay respect, but also a day for Canadians to be proud. Donna? All right, Eric Sorensen, thanks. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said the last time he spoke inside this basilica was when he delivered a eulogy at his own father's funeral, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, 24 years ago. Today he was there to speak about a man who was not a political ally, but who he respected and sought advice from. He was incredibly generous with everyone. In fact, while we were reminiscing this past week, my mum shared with me that he had reached out to her occasionally over the decades to have friendly, heartfelt conversations. I had had no idea, but I was not surprised. Because this authenticity in his many conversations with me and in his advice to me is something I always deeply valued. Trudeau was one of several former prime ministers at the funeral, including Joe Clark, Stephen Harper, and Jean Chrétien, along with many other current and former politicians. Our Ottawa bureau chief, Mercedes Stevenson, was able to speak to some of them. Mercedes, what did you hear? Donna, really about Brian Mulroney's legacy of bipartisanship and doing the right thing for the country. Of course, as a politician, he always wanted to win. He wanted his party to win. But he could see the greater interests at stake, which Prime Minister Justin Trudeau reflected on. Take a listen. He had a huge impact 40 years ago. He had a huge impact four years ago as he helped Canada and me uh, negotiate through a very challenging time with our free trade deal with the United States. We will remember him and his example of leadership a long time. And Donna, that outreach often came over the phone, as his good friend Frank McKenna told us. What I remember about him is that he, he, he accomplished things large and small, the small acts of kindness. Somebody once uh, said that the phone for him was a Stradivarius, and he sure used it like that. And Donna, while Brian Mulroney would reach across partisan lines on political issues, he also had a sense of empathy, something that Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie recalled fondly. With myself, when I had a much more difficult part of, of politics at one point, during the Netflix issue, at the time he called me, and he was the only one called me, because he knew when somebody's vulnerable, that's when we need the most help. So Donna, really in these times of perhaps hot takes and political clicks, a reminder to look at the humanity in politics. All right, Mercedes Stevenson, thank you. With me now is Senator Pamela Wallen. She was part of our live special earlier today during the state funeral. Senator, what struck you the most about this service? I love the remarks from Carolyn, who is, of course, Brian Mulroney's political heir. She was funny. She told a story about how her father so loved to speak that perhaps he should take the podium with him uh, when he goes, but then was so powerfully poignant at the end of her remarks, talking about the family's last moments with the Prime Minister and what he and Mila said to one another. And so I really think that she, uh, she shared so much with a public that was hungry for that detail about this family who have shared so much over yeah. the last couple of weeks. It was so deeply personal and, yes. and touching. And his granddaughter, that was such a touching moment. Just an amazing thing. She and her grandfather sang together often and she clearly has a future and listening to their voices meld today during that service was unbelievable. You know, we've heard so many stories, of course, over the last couple of weeks about Brian Mulroney mm -hmm. and, and the number of people whose lives he touched. What do you think he will most be remembered for? What mark does he leave on this country? He put us back on the international stage and we, we gained a reputation as uh, a, a country that you could turn to. Uh, he worked with Thatcher and Reagan to change their minds on apartheid, that kind of thing. But really the profound thing he did is he changed the future course of our country with his 
vision about free trade. It cost him everything politically, but he understood that we needed that if we were going to have economic clout and be an economic player. And when I think about the things that have happened in the world since, including 9-11, without that agreement in place, it would have hurt us immeasurably. So he has given us a future, and for that he's a founding father of a new Canada. All right, Pamela Wallen, thank you. My pleasure, Donna. Russia's deadliest terrorist attack in more than 20 years. Coming up, how the Kremlin is trying to link it to the war on Ukraine without evidence. The state funeral for Brian Mulroney was held here in Montreal today. We're back in a moment. Welcome back to Montreal. This is Notre Dame Basilica, where politicians, friends and family bade farewell to a former prime minister. We'll have more on that in a moment. But first, the rest of the day's news. In Russia, authorities have arrested four gunmen they suspect were responsible for the attack on a concert venue in a suburb of Moscow. More bodies have been found in the rubble. The death toll has now risen to 133. The so-called Islamic State has claimed responsibility but provided no proof to back that claim. As Mike Drolet reports, the U.S. says it has intelligence and warned Russia that extremists had imminent plans to target large gatherings. There was no mistaking the sound of gunfire, nor the chaos created from it. This eyewitness watched it all unfold as he scrambled from his seat in the balcony. They're firing machine guns, they're shooting into the crowd, he said. And to mask their escape, the attackers set fire to the building. It was the deadliest terrorist attack in Moscow in over two decades. Despite the war in Ukraine, Muscovites have lived in relative peace. I'm a grizzled old journalist and I'm shocked and, uh, you know, discombobulated by it very much. Uh, and I think r average Russians are. And I think that this peacetime veneer that we've been living in for the past couple of years will be over now. The U.S. and Canada had warned its citizens two weeks ago extremists were planning an attack. Earlier this week, Vladimir Putin dismissed the warnings from the West as a means to destabilize Russia. Russian state TV is airing interrogation video of the alleged gunmen, who they say were hired for the attack. And Russian officials say the gunmen were headed for the Ukrainian border, adding grist to the Russian narrative Ukraine was behind the massacre. This despite emphatic denials from Ukraine and the Islamic State claiming responsibility. Look, there's a lot of wish fulfillment involved when these things happen. Uh, people want it to be a certain way. They already start shaping the narrative. And that's what's happening here. Putin has vowed to punish those responsible whomever he decides that is. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Kindness for Kate ahead, the change in public response after the princess revealed she has cancer. Canadians want to be informed. That's why more Canadians than ever are turning to Global News at globalnews.ca. One of the most visited news sites in Canada on YouTube, where Global News is the number one news source in the country with the Global TV app or streaming Global News 24-7 on a smart TV. For the most extensive news coverage available on all platforms, Canada's trusted source for news, Global News. From Buckingham Palace to St. Andrews, the Scottish city where Kate and William met, and around the world, people are rallying behind the Princess of Wales. After weeks of rumours and theories, Kate put an end to the speculation about why she hadn't been seen in public by releasing a video saying she's been treated for cancer. There's been a flood of sympathetic reactions since from the British tabloid press and some celebrities who had stoked the conspiracy theories about where Kate was. Redmond Shannon reports on reaction to her deeply personal news. A shift in the mood in Windsor, a town literally built around royalty. Really upset. Yeah, it was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> I think there was a lot of conspiracies and rumours and whatnot, which was horrible. Um, I think now it's come out, she's sort of been forced to say it, which maybe she shouldn't have had to be. The test after the operation found cancer had been present. 
It was from inside the grounds of Windsor Castle that the Princess of Wales recorded her message revealing she is getting preventative cancer treatment. The video halting the weeks and waves of wild speculation, fueled somewhat by that altered Mother's Day picture. In his statement, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said he thought the princess had been unfairly treated in certain sections of the media and social media. I noticed that some people have been deleting old uh, old posts, which were, you know, mocking or you know taking offence at, at what was happening. Royal expert um, Patricia Treble wonders for how long the respite will be. For now, she says the news is a reminder that, however privileged the royals are. They are just a family. Does it humanize the royal family? Absolutely. But I think it also is a lesson learned for a lot of people that in this era of instant snap judgment, snap decisions, sometimes you have to wait a little bit to get the full story. Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, have wished Kate well, and the King has praised her statement. He is, of course, going through cancer treatment too, as is Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York. Prince William, meanwhile, well, he will continue to attend public events, but those will likely be limited with both his wife and his father battling illness. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Personal touch next, how Brian Mulroney supported people in some of their most vulnerable moments. You're looking at old Montreal. We're back in a moment. I'm Donna Friesen in Amman, Jordan. The other sign of mounting tension here came today in Baghdad. Touching off the most fierce fighting here in months. President Putin has said the hostage taking was planned abroad. Sleeping on the floor with little to eat and little hope. It is a fragile truce and no one's certain it will hold. But right now, many Westerners just think it's far too risky to come here. Donna Friesen in Iraq, Moscow, Pakistan. I'm Donna Friesen ahead tonight on Global National. There was a private part of Brian Mulroney's life that he was remarkably frank about. After he lost the leadership race to Joe Clark in 1976, he developed what he calls a serious drinking problem. He wrote about it in his memoirs. He said, I suffered from a weakness, an illness, and a combination of time and willpower made me better. Not cured, just better. It also made me extremely sensitive, he wrote, to people with similar problems. Mulroney quit drinking in 1980 and said it made him sensitive to others who were struggling. And over the years, he quietly reached out to people who he'd learned were recovering alcoholics. One of them is Liberal MP and Labour Minister Seamus O'Regan, who was at the funeral today. I spoke with him earlier. I'd gotten to know Ben, having started in television with him, and uh, meeting his family and, uh, and, and, and meeting him on several occasions. And so when I had to go to rehab just at the beginning of my time in politics, it was, I was extremely vulnerable. I yeah. didn't know what to think. Yeah. And, yeah. And then it was it became, a very difficult time. Difficult time, and, and, and it, was, it became public. Yeah. And this, a phone was, call this was evening. a problem with alcohol. That's right. Yes. That's right. That's yeah. right. Some eight years ago. Yeah. And uh, the phone rings. Uh, I picked it up. No caller ID. But I, anyway, I picked it up. Seamus, it's Brian. And when you have a voice like Brian Mulrooney, I don't know why he even feels the need to introduce himself. I knew exactly who it was. But he said to me, I was 43 and about your age when I gave up drinking. And uh, I've never regretted it. But he said, I can tell you, the only mistake I made was I gave up smoking at the same time. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss a cigarette. And I laughed so hard I almost dropped the phone. I never forgot that. I, I thanked him on numerous occasions in writing and, and in person to tell him how much that meant. And he knew, he knew how much that meant because I well, think because others had been there for him. And he, because he had gone through the same thing, right? Yes. He had, he quit drinking yes. because he knew it was creating a problem in his life. And he was open about it as well. He wrote about it in his memoirs. Indeed, indeed. And he understood it was something that got in the way, not only of, of what he wanted to do with his life, but he was hurting the ones around him that he loved. Yeah. And uh, that's and, the kind and of thing that. that a political leader does not need to do, no. right? For one thing, doesn't need to admit it. Certainly doesn't, and doesn't need to reach out to others then who are also struggling. He right. understood the humanity of politics. He understood that vulnerabilities, your vulnerability sometimes is a strength. It makes you more empathetic. Yeah. Um, and I think his family demonstrated that too. Uh, not only with empathy, but with strength and grace and poise. You're a liberal, he's a conservative, but those partisan things I think this funeral really showed 
don't have to mean as much as we sometimes think they do, especially in modern politics. I think it was mentioned in there that there is a distinct difference between being an opponent and being an enemy, or looking upon someone as an opponent as opposed to an enemy. That's how Brian, I think, saw things. He was partisan. Let's not let's let's yeah. be frank. And uh, he knew what side. You know, as he always said, you you dance with the one that brung you. Yeah. One of my favorite lines from him. Um, but he is, you know, he is to be admired for knowing when to reach across. Uh, friendship to him came first and foremost, yeah. and uh, he found friends across every aisle. Yeah, yeah, and reached out to them. Indeed, he did, and I will never forget it. And uh, like many in that in that cathedral today, in that basilica, can say, change lives, change mine. Seamus, thank you. Thanks, Tom. And that is Global National for this Saturday. I'm Donna Friesen, always one to strike up a tune, a fitting tribute today as Brian Mulroney sang himself out of his own state funeral. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we That famous baritone, a recording of Mulroney was played singing We'll Meet Again as his casket was carried out of Notre Dame Basilica, his eldest son Ben like singing along. Thanks for watching and good night Till from Montreal. The skies drive the dark clouds far away. So will you please say hello to the folks that I know? Tell them I won't be long. They'll be happy to know that as you saw me go, I was singing this song.